Hello and welcome to this Multiplex Podcast. My name is Dave Dalton. Today's topic is why multimedia? But before we tackle that question, let's deal with a simple definition of multimedia. Obviously, multimedia implies two or more media, text and graphics, text and images. And, and that's multimedia, right? A PowerPoint slide with, with uh, text and a piece of clip art on it. Well, consider that we have changing perspectives on technology and media in our culture all the time, and especially today with the development of new development in, uh, environments, new tools, new delivery platforms, um, new literacies, new expectations or ways of looking at information. Together we have uh, a new culture of technology, um, a new perspectives on, on what's good and what's bad and how much of it uh, is around us. So does PowerPoint count? Well, actually, you know, PowerPoint gives us a great opportunity to hone a new definition of multimedia. And you might want to start with who's actually built the media. Has the, the user added the media or just selected from what's there? That is, have they designed the text, the animation, the graphics, or just selected them? Um, did they record original music or shoot original video? Um, and is the presentation intelligent? Is it just a PowerPointless click through a bunch of linear slides that are text heavy and kind of boring? Or does it adapt in some intelligent way to the user? In other words, is the presentation smart or dumb? And that might lead us to uh, a more sophisticated definition of multimedia. That multimedia is a user-centered information environment with rich and varied media that adapts intelligently to the user. And this adaptation implies scripting. So what is scripting? Well, usually by scripting we mean using a programming language of one form or the other to create conditional responses to the user or to the environment, usually to the user. So what's a conditional response? Well, let's deal with a simple one. Uh, if it rains outside, then I'll carry my umbrella. But in the context of instruction, we might have conditions like if the student scores three out of five, then the lesson will automatically be reviewed. Or if the student is taking too long to respond, the lesson might speed up to get them to pay more attention, slow down to give them more time. It might automatically bring up a help menu, send them an email, uh, time them out so that uh, an instructor can come and help them, and, and many, many more possibilities. So that's, that's uh, probably a better definition of multimedia to, to work with. Um, rich media that behaves intelligently. In today's culture, we often deal with multimedia in terms of its richness and its ubiquity. And let's deal with each one of those kind of uh, individually. So certainly richness implies um, how compelling or, or accurate or interesting uh, the media is itself. Um, so here's a, a picture that we took on a vacation to Hawaii a couple of years ago um, uh, of the active volcano. Uh, the, Clouds you're seeing in the background aren't actually clouds. They're plumes of steam uh, that are being thrown off as the hot lava um, pours into uh, the Pacific. They're forming a new island um, every second. Now, of course, I could just describe this sunset to you. It's you know purple and orange, and there's some steam clouds against a, um, uh, behind a background of opaque black trees. But I think that you probably find the image, although it's not great quality in this slideshow, but, but the image um, is probably far more compelling and connotive. That mean that sort of implies you put yourself in a sunset someplace by seeing a photograph like this or perhaps you know, wish you were in a sunset uh, like this uh, uh, now. So um, probably better to use media to uh, provide that sort of emotional connection to experience beyond um, the kind of limited descriptions that most of us are capable of and certainly are are contained in your average kind of PowerPoint presentation. There's another phenomenon going on in our culture that I've, I've called the blockbuster phenomenon, not because of uh, blockbuster video stores, uh, but because of the tendency now uh, of Hollywood to produce, it uh, seems like only really two kinds of films anymore, uh, romantic comedies and um, um, big action blockbusters. So what I'd like you to do is while you're looking at this picture of the latest Indiana Jones quadrilogy, that is Indiana Jones and the Kingdom of the Crystal Skull, what you're seeing here is Harrison Ford about to jump from one speeding amphibious jeep um, with the good guys, his son and his, um, the mother of his uh, son, over onto the speeding uh, amphibious jeep 
uh, with the armed uh, with AK-47 Russian troop so that he can disarm them or prevent the guy from shooting on his tires. And of course this film is filled with almost every minute of, of the most creative weird chase scenes that you can imagine. Um, sword fights on these jeeps and the jeeps, I hope I don't spoil anything for anybody, and these jeeps um, going over two waterfalls and of course uh, our heroes are always okay uh, at the end. I don't know about you, but if I go over one 300-foot waterfall, I'm, it's going to ruin my day. Um, so the blockbuster phenomenon is that that these these films come out uh, typically, um, you know, every couple of years, uh, many any particular year, but the series they they can, kind of kick them out every two years, and these are typically about 200 million dollars to produce. Um, and they're thoroughly enjoyable for the most part, but thoroughly forgettable. They tend to focus on action, um, always escalating the, the special effects and sequences, um, generally at the expense of character development. The, the sort of thinking is, well, we did character development in the first one, so let's now concentrate on the stuff that people are paying to see, the, the good chase scenes and fight scenes and, and thrilling actions. Now, of course, there's nothing wrong with that. I, I go to them. I find them thoroughly entertaining. entertaining. But this is a really good film example for me. I saw this in the theater when it first came out. Uh, took my son. We enjoyed it, giggled about it, laughed about it, talked about it afterwards. And then I saw it recently on TV uh, uh, when he was over for dinner. And um, we didn't remember any of what we'd seen before. I think we liked it better the second time. Um, but really, every scene in it seemed brand new to us. You know, vaguely familiar, but nothing particularly memorable. And, you know, contrast that with um, uh, a film from the the 60s or 50s even, where much slower paced, but uh, you might have seen the film um, Vertigo starring uh, Jimmy Stewart, where uh, in one scene he's in the, the clock tower chasing who he believes the love of his life, and he has his back uh, pressed against the wall because he can't look down the spiral-looking staircase, and as Hitchcock takes us down that view of the, the first-person view, uh, we're, we're uh, swooning a little bit, we're nauseous, we, we empathize so directly with the performance and the character. You don't seem to get that uh, very much out of out of um, uh, this blockbuster phenomenon film. Let's try one more example. Uh, without me telling you, try to remember if you saw, guess what um, big budget action sequel this scene from is from. The, um, pretty um, remarkable idea in terms of special effects. Launching a uh, you know, four thousand dollar, four thousand pound car at a helicopter. I hope that's done in miniatures. Maybe not. Um, pretty, pretty uh, exotic kind of effect. Have you remembered the film yet? Live Free or Die Hard, the fourth film in the um, Die Hard trilogy. Again, a movie I thoroughly enjoyed. Would watch several times and remember almost none of it, um, film to film. So some people are particularly critical of this phenomenon and call, call these just expensive simulacra. They're inauthentic in their experience because we've seen it all, done it all before. It's just new combinations of the same material without um, producing anything new uh, for us except spending lots of money and producing new uh, kinds of experiences with these, these exotic, um, often computer-generated effects. Well, while you're trying to remember the last big blockbuster you saw and really remember it, um, consider the 2010 uh, films. The top 10 uh, of the top 10 grossing films of 2010, six of 10 were either remakes or sequels. Six of 10. Um, if you don't remember, the number one film of 2010 was Toy Story 3. Okay. So our second idea related to multimedia in our culture is the concept of ubiquity. That is the omnipresence or, or everywhereness of multimedia in our culture. And uh, 2010 again was, was a um, particularly remarkable year in, in that it saw the development of the iPad as the first sort of mainstream um, large tablet uh, portable device that sold millions and millions um, uh, during 2010 and is predicted in its second iteration to sell uh, as many in 2011 perhaps more. Um, so consider the uh, iPad I had in 1990 and now the iPad I have in 2010. Uh, obviously my 2010 uh, iPad is a bit more capable. Um, this is a promo shot taken by Apple Computer and, and uh, it kind of gives you some sense of the remarkability of this device. On the left is a GPS map that is keyed to the web and looks up your locations and finds things around you. You want to find a Chinese food place and within the three blocks of your maybe more typically for most of us we're lowing, running low on gas and we need a gas station. You bring up your GPS and um, an application like Around Me um, will find it. 
you want to find that restaurant you just give your appliance a shake and it randomly pulls up uh, restaurants in your price range uh, near you based on the GPS coordinates. So a fairly remarkable multimedia appliance. Um, the iPad uh, uh, displays um, beautiful quality video, um, all kinds of computer applications and um, audio, all, all of the things that you sort of expect from a computing device um, on a, a very small portable appliance. Uh, and of course um, omnipresently connected to the internet either through uh, 3G technology, um, uh, telephony technology or, or Wi-Fi. Um, but along with the um, iPad as a display appliance, uh, there have been new commercial models to get uh, media to us. Um, Apple has pioneered a lot of these with the iTunes store model. Um, we have uh, video, audio, film, books, uh, all kinds of stuff um, available to us uh, for a small rental fee. And Apple's, one of its greatest contributions as a company, I think, is being able to find uh, ways of negotiating those distribution models with um, the companies that hold the copyright to those materials. But along with, with having the sort of commercially available books, media, uh, etc. available to us, um, these new delivery platforms have created a flattening of the development environment, a development in landscape. Now everybody is making apps. Um, a new phrase entered our lexicon in the last couple of years. There's an app for that. Well, there probably is. There, there are millions now of applications um, being produced because it's relatively straightforward to do and there's a small potential profit involved in it and a bunch of the the uh, overhead um, and hassle for for creative people developing uh, programs for uh, technology has been removed you no longer have to wrestle with um, uh, becoming a big company competitor with Microsoft or Apple or Adobe you can kinda go into business um, um, on your own and frankly these companies are encouraging that they, they don't see it as big competition they see it as enhancements. So we have um, two important trends with the ubiquity of, of um, um, media. New platforms and new content and new, new uh, ways of getting content to us. So let me just mention a, a few platforms to take a quick look at if you're not familiar with them. Um, audio, a really great example is iTunes. Uh, Apple has con uh, continued to sort of purchase uh, competitors and enhancements to the audio side of iTunes um, and expanding the quality and offerings of of um, music through the iTunes Store, um, applications available through the iTunes Store, television, video, audiobooks, uh, electronic books, uh, and uh, podcasts, um, and soon probably more. If you're interested in animation, um, all, all kinds of animation, of course, all over the web, but two fun sites, um, Joe Fish and Jib Jab. And Jib Jab you probably have heard of because uh, they do an end of the year political wrap up parody every year um, that, that's uh, pretty darn amusing and creative uh, to most. In the world of photography, of course, there's uh, Flickr and Picasa. Flickr owned by Yahoo, Picasa by Google. Um, and what's kind of remarkable about these um, um, photo sites not only do they have simple photo editing tools and uh, storage for online photos, they also have social networking um, so that you can find people who are interested in the subject material, your photographs, and, and connect in new ways around media. Um, a particularly interesting kind of little piece of technology um, called iFi uh, allows you to, it's an SD card and a Wi-Fi device built into one. You, you fill up your iFi and uh, you walk in through a Wi-Fi network of some kind and automatically grabs all your photos off the card and uploads them wirelessly to your Flickr, Flickr or Picasa account um, and makes your photos from your family vacation instantly available to grandma or grandpa without you doing a darn thing. They're automatically um, shuffled off the card and placed on the web. So some dramatic and uh, fun um, enhancements on how we um, do old things uh, have become new again. But of course, probably the most dramatic um, uh, type of technology, multimedia, that's that's been around in the last few years is uh, brought to us by our friends uh, in YouTube. And for me, one of the most interesting um, spins on YouTube is, is how great an example of it is uh, about how technology delivery platforms here drive our sense of, of what is good and bad, uh, our aesthetics. So let's just quickly review the history of uh, YouTube. 
um, YouTube was purchased by Google a few years ago. Um, a few years ago, I had the, the opportunity to um, visit the Google campus and um, was given a demonstration of how Google runs their infrastructure, not just for Google, uh, not just for YouTube, but for Google Docs and all of their online storage. And it's really kind of interesting if you're uh, into to such things. Um, they have pioneered um, very inexpensive and efficient um, server farms. Um, if you can picture in your mind a box about 18 by 18 inches um, as big as a very small form factor um, desktop computer, in that form factor they've placed four servers. What they've done is pioneered very small technology and very cheap components and created them redundantly so that if one fails, gosh, there's another one waiting to pick up the slack right away. But rather than buy these very expensive enterprise level uh, pieces of technology, um, they've developed their own mom and pop cheap um, servers, very, very high density, and they stack them from floor to ceiling and row after row after row in secret um, bunkers uh, around the world to provide storage. But even with this very efficient uh, and cheap um, storage model, um, you know, they were hemorrhaging money over YouTube. They just could not keep up with the demand. So in the beginning, they imposed uh, some fairly restrictive size and length limits on the video. Uh, in the early days, video was typically about 320 by 240, kind of postage stamp by our, our uh, sensibilities today. Um, but even at that, uh, they, they couldn't keep up with the demand. Um, and they've never been able to um, uh, find a way to commoditize their investment with video. That is, they've never been able to find a way to make a buck with it. Sure, there are um, the um, uh, infamous Google ads on um, the YouTube search engine and on every display page, but frankly, those just don't make very much money. Um, they've never been able to find a way to purchase content to show on it, uh, to ink the kind of deals that Apple's been so good at doing. Um, so Google tends to, to continue to lose money on YouTube. But um, uh, soon, uh, uh, right now, they're, they're developing, they've released uh, Google TV, uh, which some critics have been very critical of, um, comparing it to long-established uh, companies like Apple and Amazon and Netflix and saying, you know, it's inadequate compared to those. But as of the time of this recording, they've been at that business for two months. Um, give them a chance. Uh, they, they may well revolutionize how we all watch television. But frankly, they already have um, revolutionized how we all watch uh, a video and, and what we expect out of video. Um, the quickie YouTube video um, drove a lot of small, low-quality, one-liner jokes, pranks, gotcha videos, and um, people chortle over those. They find those to be um, hysterical and watch them all the time. And especially the gotcha videos where a politician says something inappropriate, um, those go viral. Uh, within days, they're generating millions of um, hits, uh, people viewing those videos. Now, even with... Uh, uh, Google uh, having a better infrastructure and, and lifting some of those size limits, we still kind of expect web video to be small. Uh, our, our, it's, it's driven down our expectations in terms of the quality of the media and, frankly, the quality of the content. Um, but it's driven up our expectations of the immediacy and ubiquity of that. Um, we expect it to be on YouTube right now um, and available to us. Uh, everything should be available to us. Well, um, some people uh, describe this phenomenon of, of sort of watching little dissociated clips of, of things as, as non-episodic. There is no beginning, middle, or end. It's just always, well, always the middle. Um, and, and this is um, a, a sort of a significant concern for a lot of educators when kids are going home and watching viral clips of stuff with no storyline. Um, you know, in education for the millennia, we have thought about stories. Um, we tell the story in history. We tell the story in science. We even tell the story in um, uh, math to some extent. And we tell, certainly tell the story in our language arts or, or language curricula. Um, those stories have beginning, middles, and ends, or at least beginnings and middles. Uh, in the case of science, there's an ongoing um, end. We don't know where the story ends. Um, but um, for a generation of kids who are raised without that episodic kind of sensibility, it's troubling to teachers who, who know nothing more. Um, we, we understand the world as a series. Um, so uh, it's, it's a difficult adjustment for adults to make, probably more so than kids. One, one thing we sort of know for sure about uh, media is that the way we get information changes how we think. 
this is not a new idea at all. Um, there's actually been compelling research that goes back to the 60s that studied film and radio um, and, and introducing radio broadcasts to um, sort of uh, village cultures uh, really changed people's expectations about their worlds and changed how they thought and what they valued. Of course, it would be no, no less uh, reasonable to expect that technologies like YouTube and the web would change how people think uh, and process information. Um, so the phenomenon just continues. It's not like uh, YouTube invented this um, lately. But, um, you know, in, in the field of education, there is, is legitimate concern that uh, um, media should make education fun. Um, the episodic teacher, the episodic digital immigrant might say, you know, learning's not supposed to be fun. You're supposed to pay attention. You're supposed to glean from this presentation the information that I want you to. Um, you shouldn't care what form it's in. You should be, be uh, mining the information regardless of its form. Well, obviously, um, uh, our, our web generation kids think about the, the world very differently. Um, if it's not interesting, if it's not entertaining, they're, they're going to give it much less attention and much less regard. Um, this phenomenon sort of began to hit the mainstream culture um, in the early 80s with um, the advent of Sesame Street, um, something that I've called over the years the Big Bird phenomenon because, you know, frankly, it seems a little crazy now. But Big Bird was blamed for, you know, ruining our kids. Uh, if you've ever seen an episode of Sesame Street, probably you have as either a kid or a parent, you probably know how um, fast-paced it was compared to other uh, television programs of its day. Uh, you know, there was a recurring storyline, but they cut in and out, and there was, um, you know, the count counting, and Cookie Monster, and Bert and Ernie, and all kinds of stuff going on all the time. There was a lot of flash and movement and, and sound, um, something that was new, and, and many people um, have, have talked about how Sesame Street has sort of chunked up learning stimuli to the point that it's reduced the ability of kids to attend to um, longer, less fun, less entertaining um, educational stimuli like what's found typically in a K-16 classroom. So we'll return to this concept of chunking a little bit later in a future podcast, but um, certainly we can conclude that um, multimedia has has driven us to expect um, more uh, richness and more omnipresence of, of media all around us. So at this point it might be reasonable to ask you know, what about kids? What's their role in multimedia? You know, my view and, and how I'd like to, to uh, the, the sort of the point of this podcast is to, to advocate strongly that it's important for, for kids to be producers and not just consumers of multimedia. Uh, certainly we can argue, and I will in just a moment, that it's important for kids to be thoughtful and enlightened consumers, but more importantly than that, we know that the cognitive effort and processes involved in developing technology, developing multimedia, is far more sophisticated and important to their future development um, than just being good consumers of it. So let's begin with a, the, this, um, my levels of uh, multimedia use, beginning with what, what it means to be a good consumer. Uh, selecting um, the, um, the programming that you want to, to experience. Attending to it carefully, getting out of it what you need to get out of it. Um, integrating that information into some other um, uh, uh, sphere. Um, I'm integrating that into my existing uh, schema. I'm using that information to accompany other information, that kind of thing. And probably the most important one here is to be a uh, to view media through a critical lens to evaluate its veracity, its quality. Um, um, there's a, a lot of, of conversation in our culture about um, um, how uh, much kids are influenced by things around them, how much they're influenced by violent video games, for example, or or um, graphic, sexual, or violent material on television. Um, the jury's kind of out on that stuff. We we certainly know that. Uh, kids who are prone to violence or prone to acting out are influenced by those messages. But it seems kind of irrefutable that, that advertisements work. The, the simple evidence there is that advertisers spend billions of dollars on um, different kinds of ad campaigns a year. If Ford Motor Company didn't believe that you're more likely to buy an F-150 after watching a Ford truck ad, they wouldn't spend the billions of dollars on their ad campaign. They'd pay it to the stockholders or, heck, build better vehicles. Um, so advertisers know that advertising is persuasive. The degree to which it's persuasive we could debate um, and it can be analyzed, but just take one example uh, of, of what we're worried about with kids these days. Um, uh, consider the soft drink Mountain Dew. 
uh, a very heavily advertised product, Do the Do. Uh, Mountain Dew sponsors lots and lots of television commercials and campaigns, but they sponsor extreme sporting events. They sponsor lots of events. So you see the Mountain Dew logo every place and free Mountain Dew and Mountain Dew, Mountain Dew everywhere. Well, you know, the sort of reality is that, that uh, Mountain Dew and modern soft drinks are sweetened with high fructose corn syrup. Um, and most kids, uh, most teenagers are drinking um, slightly less than three soda pops a day which is something on the order of five to six hundred extra calories a day. Um, their level of physical activity is declining, their caloric intake is increasing, hence we're dealing with an epidemic of teenage obesity. But beyond obesity, high fructose corn syrup, ha especially in immoderate um, uh, intake like we're talking about, has been shown to do significant damage to uh, internal organs, kidneys and liver, um, beyond what sucrose, the regular uh, table sugar, does. Um, you may have seen that there are some, some soft drink manufacturers that are kind of going retro and using sugar rather than the cheaper corn corn syrup in their drinks because of these effects. So, um, you know, I, I'm not trying to be excessively political here, but it's pretty clear that the Pepsi-Cola company that makes Mountain Dew is hawking a, a, a product that, that the way they want you to use it is, is not safe. It's not um, a, a good thing for teenagers to be doing. Um, it, it's a little reminiscent, although not uh, quite as serious, not, not at all as serious, as tobacco. Um, tobacco companies were found guilty and fined huge amounts of money for aggressive marketing to, to uh, teenagers. And, and the evidence there is kind of irrefutable. It's been, been found to be true in courts of law. Uh, these companies are are guilty of of uh, getting kids to smoke. Uh, you know, 12, 13, 14 years of age. Um, the average smoker today uh, became addicted in their teens, and one third of those um, people will die from from using the product as the manufacturers intended to be used. Um, in other words, multimedia messages work. It is critical, uh, I think, that we help kids um, be good prudent, uh, enlightened, wise consumers and question. Uh, you know, you, you might say a 17 or 18 year old is probably not, not so dumb that they would believe the hype that they see in commercials. And that might be true. But what about the four or five year old, um, the, uh, the six or seven year old? Um, you know, wiser people than me will have better opinions about this. But certainly it's, at some point or another, it's important to help kids uh, sort out truth from false in uh, the multimedia messages around them. So what about kids as producers of multimedia? Well, uh, here uh, the five stages design kind of means to come up with a plan. Um, irrespective of actually uh, developing technology, it really is planning um, for whom it's going to be used, what messages are going to go in it, that kind of thing. The development might be shooting the video, recording the audio, um, um, developing uh, text slides, photographs, that kind of thing. Authoring involves that, that nagging scripting question of ours again, bringing it together, making it intelligent, making it uh, adaptive and responsive. Packaging is, um, you know, converting that uh, um, media into whatever format it needs to, to go in until it's in its final version uh, to, to go to the audience. Um, this is, by the way, just, just as an aside, back to our PowerPoint non-example, this is where a lot of PowerPointlessness just falls completely flat and, and becomes absurd. We might have uh, kids work on fairly elaborate text-based uh, presentations that are designed to be visual aids for them to sort of stand in front of a class but we never have them practice or work through how they're going to present this um, uh, material to an audience. Uh, we never have them think about uh, where the PowerPoint goes. We never have them actually get to the point where they're reasonably competent at packaging the material for the audience that it's intended to, to be used with. And finally, uh, distributing multimedia. Um, does it go on a website? Does it go on a DVD? Um, how are we actually going to get this out? Do we just make it for the teacher? Do we make it for the teacher and then it gets thrown away? Do we make it for the teacher and then, you know, mom and dad hang it on the refrigerator? Really, is there a wider audience? Is there is there a way to get this information out? And, you know, YouTube is a very uh, easy and powerful distribution channel for video, for example. Okay, so if we take the, the concept of the... Um, uh, producer of multimedia, we might integrate that with the idea of the term paper of the future. Now, you know, you can think of the term paper of the present as the, you know, the 15-page uh, five-part essay with citations 
And we can dry, derive a whole language arts curriculum around that. Um, but without goring anybody's sacred cow here, um, it, it's likely to be perceived as inauthentic, certainly to the students, but, but to most of us if we sit and sort of think about it. Um, now, I write a lot as, as an adult, but I'm pretty unusual in that uh, capacity. Certainly most K-12 teachers do not write 15-page papers, and almost no other professions uh, have you do that. So, so the, the rationale for being able to do it in high school is to be able to do it in college, and after college, it's never done again. So the rationale for doing it in college, of course, is, you know, broad-based liberal arts, you know, well-exercised mind. And if that's the rationale, then it gives us kind of a shooting fish in the barrels um, rationale for doing these other things as well. If, if, if uh, writing is a mental exercise, then is it inferior, superior, or just another exercise compared to developing a multimedia brochure in a program like Publisher or ideally something more sophisticated like in, in design? Um, graphics, um, including you know graphs from numerical data like you might find in Excel or graphics in a program like Illustrator or a real graphic um, design uh, program. Um, images um, shot with a digital camera, uh, composited and, and corrected in Photoshop. Database reports, an incredibly important skill um, in our information-based economy, something that we just don't do, K-16. Uh, it's, an es it's perceived as a very esoteric computery skill, and yet all of us live in a sea of data all the time. Developing websites, and just let me uh, again harp on that scripting point. 99% of websites today involve dynamic content, scripted content, not just HTML or you know making a web page and saving it as an HTML file, but actually getting in and working with the code behind the website through some sort of programming technology. 99% of websites, in fact, the only people that make static websites are personal users. Uh, commercial websites are basically 100% dynamic, integrating database content, um, visual images, visual design, and code to make it all come to life and interact. Certainly if you've ever purchased a book from Amazon.com or any other e-vendor, you've used a dynamic scripted website. Recording audio and video, and again, the, the idea of pulling this stuff together in a nonlinear adaptive um, form uh, in any one of these um, constituent technologies. So the term paper of the future involves the same basic process that we, we've always used for writing. That is, there's a planning phase, there's a composition phase, and there's an editing or rewriting or perfecting phase. Um, I think I could make a pretty good argument that, that many of these technologies lend themselves better to the cognitive process uh, that we often call the writing process. If we call that the composition process, where we're composing and, and text is one kind of composition, all of these are good examples of, of the kinds of skills that we ask kids to glean from the term paper. So finally, let's return to the question we began with. Why multimedia? And my simple answer to that question is because we have to. We have to because it's the nature of the culture in which our kids uh, live. They're bombarded by multimedia all the time. If they don't learn to make it, all they'll ever be is consumers, consumers of somebody else's information, whether that information is true or false. If we don't do multimedia, we'll produce uh, another generation of couch potatoes who are ineffectual uh, consumers, uh, ineffectual citizens, um, and in many ways, simply ineffectual. Why multimedia? Because we have to. Well, that's it for this podcast. I uh, hope you've enjoyed it. And um, join us again for our next uh, version of Multiplex. Headed west into the black. I'm going